I got friends only want to talk business. I got expensive, cause when is expensive. I got expensive, cause when is expensive. I've been reading all the work. And I've been shutting down the stars. And welcome to Put That Coffee Down, the freight sales show for closers. My name is Kevin Hill. I'm your host as usual here. Tuesdays on Freight Waves TV, 12 p.m. Eastern Time. We have a great show for you today. We have Nick Dangles. He is the co-founder over at Kinetic. And what they do is they, they help freight tech companies out and also freight brokers sales. We're going to talk about uh, a, a, a partnership that they have and talk about sales training, which is always important. We're also going to talk about since it's January, it's 2023, it's a brand new year, it's a new beginning, if you will. We're going to talk about creating a list of dream accounts and what goes into that list, what you need to know about them, and how to qualify what's really a dream account. Is a dream account uh, someone like Walmart or Target or Apple that sounds really cool? Or a dream account is uh, an account that really fits in what you do, how you can operate, and how you can maximize bringing in, whether that's gross margin, gross revenue, uh, however you count it. If you're a freight broker and if, if you're in freight tech, carrier sales, uh, whatever your, your commission is tied to, how do you mac maximize that? And that is one of the, the, the key ingredients of creating a dream uh, account list. Because if you're not doing that, then uh, what you're doing is is really spinning your wheels because uh, you need to define to those accounts that match in perfectly with what you do. It is very important. But yeah, it's, it's January, it's 2023. It is all about sales goals. It is all about uh, making margin, having a new beginning, having a new lease on life in a lot of ways. So that's what we're going to talk, talk, talk about with... Um, with Nick right now, I think Nick is ready to have to come on the show. So, without any further ado, let's uh, let, let's break down the conversation and talk a little bit about training and uh, dream accounts. Welcome, Nick. Hey, Kevin, thanks for having me on, man. Happy Tuesday. Happy Tuesday. Always a pleasure uh, to have you on the show and talk talk with you. Uh, see how Kinetic is going. And also some of your partnerships. So, if you want to uh, to, to start the show off and, and kind of start off with with telling the audience uh, what Kinetic does and, and kind of what ventures that you're in right now. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, thanks for the quick intro there. So, a little bit more about myself. Um, I'm the co-founder of Kinetic, and like you said, we work with freight tech companies to help them get their products to market more quickly and with better adoption. And relatively recently, we kicked off a joint project with Metaphora, which is called Sync Logistics Training, which is a platform to help brokers with every aspect of their training process, from new hire training all the way through um, continuing education and professional development. Now, I, we talk about sales training, talk about the freight brokers world. I, I, I think both of us could spend here for the next, spend the next 30 minutes Uh you know, digging, make, making it a little fun about the traditional training models that probably uh, that I came in uh, with, which was uh, here's a phone, here's a, a phone book almost, right? Here's here's the, the bad leads in the CRM. Uh, here's your training. Talk talk to anybody that you want to to, uh, to if you have any questions. Yeah, I mean, I agree. What I've found in my experience is the training kind of. Don't get me wrong, some companies do it very well, but there are a lot of companies that either do what you mentioned in terms of, hey, man, like you're a new hire, here's a phone, here's DAT, here's a list of leads, like best of luck to you. And kind of on the more reasonable end of that spectrum, there are a lot of companies who do like these two, three week, however long training courses where you learn everything from, well, what a dry van is to how to track a driver to like how intermodal and air freight operate. But the reality is after those couple of weeks, you're going to be tracking freight or booking carriers on loads. And did you necessarily need to know how LTL and air freight work? Well, not necessarily. So our goal is to kind of give that a more structured process for those new hires. And then like from a continuing education perspective, a lot of time that just doesn't happen, right? Like once you're a carrier up, for instance, making a decent amount of money booking loads, like the mentality is that you're good. So a lot of times they don't get that like professional development training. So we really wanted to put sync out into the world to help fix that too. 
Yeah, it's it, it's hard to learn an industry before you you're on the sea. It, it's going to be continuing the education, right? Especially for I, I'd say the first six months because it is it is a tough market to learn, especially when you get into to LTL. I mean, just learning one mode of of truckload is is difficult enough. I, I, I did a lot of flatbed, uh, or let's just say open deck, right? Flatbed, step deck mm-hmm. over, you know, a heavy haul, kind of over dimensional loads, over dims. And that it's a world away from the dry van market. It's it's not even in the same ballpark as refrigerated market. And then when people start talking about LTL, my eyes would just glaze over because I, you know, and then you talk about air freight. I mean, those are completely different universes almost. Oh, 100%. And a lot of times those things do get thrown into new higher training programs. But the reality is you just, like that's not your specialty. That's not what they're going to do. So you don't necessarily need to know that. It's nice to know later on, right? As you start getting into more of those advanced things. But at the beginning, like really structure that training program to focus on your core concepts, right? And then as you go on, start bringing in additional things like um, a communication and conflict res- resolution, those soft skills that people need to know in brokerage. Let's talk about the soft skills because that is something that, that you really didn't need to know. You're basically, if, if you're a freight broker, if you're in transportation at all, right? Freight forwarder, uh, uh, you know, carrier sales or asset based uh, sales or even freight tech, uh, sales is all about negotiation, right? It's all about their soft skills. It's all about reading the room, uh, knowing the, the process internally within a company. I, I think that is a very important thing to really realize. And a lot of that is qualifying. A lot of that's discovery calls. But it, it's it's also having the right, right frame of mind to go into to every sales call, whether it's a cold call or a discovery call, qualifying call, however you want to call it. And, 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 and thinking strategically like it's a game of chess because it really is a game of chess. Yeah, I mean, I wrote a blog post about this a long time ago. Um, so shameless plug to myself, could read that blog post. But I think a lot of these skills get overlooked in brokerage. You know, like there's there's this like phrase that gets kicked around periodically that like I brokered freight for 10 years and all I learned was the rate from Chicago to Atlanta or whatever. And like I I kind of get where that comes from, but at the same time, like you should be learning a lot more than that just by virtue of what you're doing every day. I mean, think how think about how often things like negotiating or contract resolution come up in the day-to-day of a brokerage. The, the problem is that no one's actually getting this training and it's not being pointed out to folks that this is what they're doing. But like in my opinion, at least, like brokering freight's a really tough job that requires a lot of different skills, particularly the soft, soft skills that we just mentioned. And you mentioned conflict resolution, and you put a time frame of day to day. I'd say minute by minute. Uh, if you're doing it right, mm-hmm. you should have conflicts throughout the the day because that means the more freight you have on the road, and freight comes with conflicts. So whether it's claims, right, late pickups, late deliveries, uh, you know, any number, a myriad of issues, detention on the driver's side, uh, deadhead. Being able to, to talk to people, to, to be able to negotiate, to, to be able to, to find, you know, and it's a cliche, a win-win so- solution. Uh, but that's what you really have to do. You, you have to, to add value into, to, you know, even deadhead models, right? And make it sound rosy. Make it rosy. And not just sound rosy, but but give some little kicker. And there's always little kickers that, that you can throw in there or sweeteners, as they say, uh, that really don't cost you anything. And that could be as easy as just being ultra responsive or, um, you know, a good greeting. It does. You have to pick your own kind of spots on that, that, that part, but that goes back into the soft skills. Yeah. And what's funny is like how much of brokerage actually relates back to sales. I mean, a lot of times you think about it in the more traditional context of, well, customer reps are selling to their customers but at the same time, like your carriers are just as important. So carrier reps have to sell your available freight to their carriers. And then even within the office itself, like you have to kind of, I'll steal a phrase from Adam Perlmutter here and say, you have to internally market your carriers. And actually the carrier reps have to sell their carriers and their capacity to account managers to make sure that they're able to fill up their trucks. So it's 
it's fascinating to me how many different ways sales and soft skills really comes into play in brokerage. It, it is. It really is fascinating. Another fascinating thing that, that I've been thinking about recently my, myself is that internal buying decision dynamic, right? And being able to uh, play the, the bureaucracy or the political game of decision making with your, your customers and the bigger your customer is, right? Uh, the, the more politics and bureaucracy that, that flows into it and being able to navigate that through the sales props often is the, the difference between uh, having die sell out and having a sell die out after spending six months and, and spending time and resources or actually closing deal, getting some freight at the end of the day. Maybe that's nine or 12 months uh, down the road, but uh, it, it's really navigating those, those, those waters that are often unknown. And, and being good at, at, at really discovering who's making the decisions, why they're making the decisions, what you need to do, and, and talking to uh, a number of people within an organization to, to, to find that information, but keep chugging along with it. Yeah, and especially like going into kind of a more like deflationary market that we're going into right now, it becomes more and more important to have that training and to have those processes. So if you're a broker right now who's struggling to land accounts, like maybe ask yourself if you've really trained your people up and given them the tools they need to succeed in sales and brokerage. That's a really good point because if you're counting on, on superstars and, and I, I recorded an audio version of, of put that cop down with Charlie Saffro and we had a, a good discussion about that over at, at CS recruiting is if you're relying on, on just hiring superstars or people who fit the mold who are going to be um, uh, be, be the, the, the big hitters, right? Uh, you, that, that's not a process, right? That, that's kind of hope. That, that's a mm -hmm. lot of hope, a lot of betting on long shots. And, you know, it, it goes down to training. If you're going to run a successful growing brokerage, especially, right, you need to hire people in adapt them to a system that works, train them to that system, whatever that system may be that, that works for you. And that's where growth comes from. It's not coming, uh, it's not going out and hiring, you know, people who are superstars and they're just naturals and, you know, Robert, Robert Refford, right. And the natural who, uh, who's just going to come in and just bring a book of business and, or create a book of business within three months. I mean, that's just, unrealistic ex ex expectations at that point. Yeah. And I mean, part of, I guess I'll, I'll relate this to carrier sales a little bit. Part of carrier sales is having that process of like continuously sourcing new capacity and new carriers for yourself. Right. So when you're hiring a, like a carrier up and they appear to be a superstar on paper, well, is it just because that they're like the freight they currently have available matches what's in their book of business? Because if your freight then doesn't match what's what's in their book, well, they're going to have a terrible time of servicing your freight if they're not still sourcing new carriers and approaching things strategically. Yeah, you're exactly right. You, that that context, right? Does this process make the superstar or the superstar is just a superstar, mm -hmm. right? And a lot of times on paper, people have been very successful, but it's working within the system that has allowed them to be successful, right? And you, you take them out of that put them into a, a different system or uh, an incomplete system or no system at all. And they flounder and you wonder why. And but the why is, is just that, you know, if you build a system to, that, that most everyone can be successful at, uh, then you, I mean, that's part of a sustainable business. Oh, absolutely. You know, I'm a big fan of having systems. I've got that quote from Atom Atomic Habits that I've thrown out like 10 times to different people in the past week or so here that we'll go into probably more when we start talking about dream customers. But what does he say? He says that um, you don't rise to the level of your goals, you fall to the level of your systems. And I think that's just a really impactful quote like for me personally and, and should be for other people too. I mean, goals are great to have, but the reality is, and like those superstars are great to have, but the reality is if you don't have the systems to back that up, you can't replicate it. No. And it's all about replication, right? And and hope isn't a strategy. You have to have a process that, that replicates it. Uh, talking about processes, how about processes to select? Do you think it's a useful uh, useful task in January? Say, I want to work for these 10 clients. 
what do I need to do to work with these 10 clients? And I'll throw a caveat in there too, because we, we've had this discussion before, Nick, is uh, are those really my 10? How do I qualify to make sure that those are my 10 and I'm just not uh, going for for shiny logos that will impress people? Yeah, I mean, it's, I'm going to sound throughout this like I'm being kind of critical of the whole dream customer concept, but I'm not. I just think you need to be really strategic about how you approach it. And like even the word dream customer, I think is kind of a fluffy term, right? Does it mean specific companies? Does it mean like a persona of companies? Um, Because you're right. Like like if you're out there chasing just big names, I mean, you might find out that those big names really aren't the customers that you want anyway. You know, maybe you're a small brokerage and while – like whatever big name enterprise customer sounds great on paper, the reality is you land them and they're slow to pay and you just can't service the freight. So like for me personally, I I lean more towards kind of having those personas, right? Like what vertical do I want to be in? What's like commodities, what specific lanes, Um, like having those different types of data points on your customers. And from there kind of building out what that dream customer persona looks like, because if you're just out there chasing like Anheuser-Busch or whatever, like you might find out that they don't match any of those data points that you are that are actually important to you. Yeah, they just move a lot of freight. So, so they move a lot of freight. An AB and Walmart, a Home Depot, right? They, they move a lot of freight. And you want a piece of that freight, but you might not be able to handle a piece of that freight, and you're just wasting your time and resources chasing something. So, it's good to do your own due diligence. Do your own investigations into kind of what they're running, kind of how the the operation works. How long it does take to, to get in the door? Because oftentimes the, the larger the, the 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 shipper, the the more time, and it could be a two three year process. It'll pay off if you if you're successful at the the end run, but that the two or three years is a lot of time to 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 hold someone in as a dream customer or however you want to term it. Right? Um, I, I think that's that, that's kind of the the folly of it in. And I do agree with the personas and you can attach a name to that persona, but as long as you're doing the right things, if you're following the process, as you're, you're talking about earlier, if you're following the process, good things will happen. And, and oftentimes those, those good things or um, things that happen that are just outside your imagination in, in, a, in a lot of ways, but it, it goes back into you, you make your own luck. So if you're following a process, if, if you're hitting a persona, if you if you have a name or two in mind, you might get those. You might get someone who fits in much better than you are that you may have never heard of in that industry group or that geography group that makes your 2023 and at the end of the day does not matter. Yeah, I couldn't agree more with what you just said. I mean... I really like your phrase about making your own luck. And then like, if you have that process, you're more likely to fall into those customers, you know? And and, like, that's what it's all about. I mean, I think it's great to have dream customers. I think it's great to have goals and have some sort of a guidepost for where you want to go. But at the same time, you need to develop that process out for yourself. And that can be things like just planning out your day, you know, like how much time am I devoting to sales calls and prospecting? What's my follow-up process look like? How am I reaching out to these people? Um, and as long as you're following those things, like you're going to see results. They're not necessarily going to be like the exact results that you wanted in terms of like company A is coming on board after six months, but you're much more likely to get a company like company A coming on board in six months if you have that process and you follow it. And a key part of that, you know, you take a persona, maybe some individual names within that persona to, to, to go after, to, to start off with. But but when I hear people talk about dream customers, creating that list, I'm going to work with them. Uh, it's, it's, it's outstanding kind of what little they really know about that company's supply chain, their shipping, their logistics, whether they have a private fleet or not. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's, it's, it, it seems like, you know, and that's this, the, the reason to knock the system a little bit, if you just list down 10 names and say, I'm going to go after these 10 names without knowing anything about them, and your first step isn't finding mm-hmm. that out, um, you, you, you're just wasting time, which is the most precious resource that any of us have, especially in sales. Yeah, I mean, in my experience talking to brokers, the like that discovery process in sales that's like just 
immensely important and emphasized throughout a bunch of different industries, it, a lot of times it's just neglected in brokerage. You know, like you get that opportunity, the customer is willing to give you a load or a chance on their bid. And the gut reaction is, yes, like send me that freight. I'll absolutely want to be a part of this bid. And <laughs> like you're just so desperate for the business and the freight, but you don't like you skip over that discovery process where like you actually figure out if this company is going to be a good fit for you. And the brokers that I know that that do have a discovery process and are a little bit more selective about what customers they want to onboard and what freight that they want. Like they're the ones who really see a lot of success. And, and, and to do that, you have to be very focused, right? You have to focus down in, as you're saying, that the product, that geography, that lane level even, and really focus on that. And that's hard to do in freight freight and logistics, right? Because you, you don't really know, you know, that's not publicly available information and it's not something that's broadcasted out. It's, it's oftentimes proprietary. So uh, to, to, to find that does take a little digging, but that, that's something that you have to, to do to, to really execute and get, uh, I, and, and when I say large accounts, they could just be large accounts for you, right? They, they don't have to be large companies. They don't mm-hmm. have to have a large freight spin. Uh, you just have to, to to pick your spots. Like when I was brokering, and I was I was like the strategy. I know a lot of people don't, but you know, just become an expert on a handful of lanes, right? And finding finding companies that that run similar lanes to that, and then coming up with a large portfolio of companies, but a very portfolio very much a narrow portfolio of lanes. And I always thought that would be a successful strategy. I know some people do employ it. Um, and it, it just makes sense to, to, to me because it narrows down. It was, I was cradled to the grave too, right? So I just want to narrow down sourcing of carriers because that can get unwieldy in, in that system as well. Yeah, I, I agree. And I think that you need to like be conscious of selling to your capacity network too. And that, like that's, Similar to what you were saying, because mm-hmm. not all freight, not all freight's good freight for you, at least. I mean, it like it might be great for somebody else, but the story I always tell is I spent a ton of my life chasing around like frozen LTL opportunities, and I did it because they were kind of falling in my lap. But at the same time, I was spending so much time trying to move frozen LTL that it was eating away at my time that I should have been that should have been spent doing things that were like much more in my wheelhouse. So like you have to really think about, is this good freight for me and my capabilities and does it fit with my capacity network? And it can be alluring because if, if you have a, a great carrier network and an execution strategy for frozen LTL, it's highly profitable, right? But the problem mm-hmm. is it takes so much time and energy to, to build that up from scratch that is it worth it? You know, it could be worth it in the the long run if you're if you're good, but you're going to be bust and, and out the door if it doesn't work because you're going to spend so much time with it. Yeah, I agree. And like one thing that I want to bring up, like before we end, to be sure I, I get this in, is that I feel like people need to be conscious of the fact that dream customers can change. You know, just because what you put out there on January first is your dream customers doesn't mean that those are going to be the same dream customers you have on your list by the time December rolls around. I mean, like over the course of the year, you might onboard other customers to force you to develop other capabilities. And by the time like August rolls around, like your dream customer list is at least slightly different from what you started the year with. And there's nothing wrong with that. You know, like things change and that's fine. I don't think there's anything wrong with that. If if you have a, a, a 10, 10 customers on there and by August, all 10 of them are scratched off and you have another 10 to replace those, I think that's good too. There, there's nothing wrong at all with that. As, as you know, I know pivoting is a key to success in, in everything. You know, you develop a plan. This is what I'm going to do. It's not working out. I'm going to adjust, 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 re- iterate, iterate, iterate. And you come up with something that that could be a, a slightly different to a lot different. But if you go with what works and get rid of what doesn't, uh, your chances and odds of success uh, increase exponentially. Yeah, I mean, if you start out at the, the beginning of the year, a typical dry van broker, and then halfway through, you find yourself finding a ton of success with flatbed. Well, shoot, man! Like pursue those flatbed opportunities. Your dream yeah. customers might change a little bit. But they might, and there's no harm in that whatsoever. Nick, 
Nick Dangles, thanks for uh, coming on and put that coffee down this week. It's been enjoyable as always. And um, and th- they can reach out to you on LinkedIn. Nick Dangles Kinetic, you're always on LinkedIn. So uh, reach out, tell Nick uh, hi, and ask him about uh, sales training. So thanks again. Yeah, appreciate you having me on, Kevin. And with that, I have some audio versions there. So if you go to to Apple Podcasts or wherever you download your podcast or on FreightCast, where we have all the Freight Waves content in one specific channel, you check those out. I have uh, you know a number of different interviews with the industry experts. So you can check those out, and you can always catch us here every Tuesday at 12 p.m. Eastern time on Freight Waves TV. I got friends only want to talk business. I got expensive, cause wind is expensive. Yeah. I got expensive, cause wind is expensive. I've been reading out of water. And I've been shutting out the stars. Yeah.